But anyway, before we get to that, which unfortunately took a lot of people's attention away from the match, the match was f***ing great. And I will say this, MJF, now that Punk is not active, is putting together the best matches start to finish for himself of anybody maybe in the business. And a lot of this stuff, it it's not it's not difficult deep shit. It's psychology. It's wrestling. And I recognize a lot of these spots that he does, but the way he puts everything together with the new stuff and the old stuff and the little stuff and the big stuff. It's like there are only a certain amount of notes in music, but the difference in the way they're put together is the difference in Happy Birthday to You and box concerto or whatever well he's mjf is stealing perpetrating researching different little things that nobody does anymore and different spots that a heel gets heat with and he's putting them together in still enough of a modern style match that it's it's impeccable and again the idea for this match was that take is the Fair-haired, young, white meat baby face. They want him to look good. The people are liking him, but obviously MJF is the champion, and he needs to get some heat. And it was from from MJF going for the handshake and giving him the boot to the gut when he opened, you know, the the match. Just that little heel bullshit. But then letting Take come back and fucking get on top of him with. The clothesline and the nine horrible punches in the corner. That's another thing Take needs to work on is his punches. Because he's been with the indie Rific crowd and he can do all the athletic moves, but it's the simple things. Um, but again, MJ, he'll hide behind the referee so he can take over and then immediately starts working the arm. And the arm is a story through the whole match. And he kept, he would give take brief hope spots, but he'd go back to the arm. And what a nice hammerlock DDT he hit without giving the kid brain damage. That's something they could note for later on in the program. You know, again, he kept this thing moving. It was put together well. And by the time he built up another little false comeback for take, where he hit the frog splash off the top, they're in El Paso, Texas. So, of course, it not only gets a two count, a big pop, but the people start chanting, Eddie, Eddie. And I, I wish I could be more full-throated in my endorsements of Young Take and really root for him more. But, of course, I've seen the video with the small schoolgirl and all the other bullshit, so he's one of them. But he's a talented one of them. He's one of the only ones I've seen. He's young enough he can be reformed. Possibly he can go to reform school. Maybe we can work on that. Get him some psychological treatment. Get him away from the wrong side of things. But he hit a Styles Clash thingy and then turned it into a wheelbarrow German suplex. And MJF would bail to the floor and the people would boo. Because that's what they're supposed to do, and they did because he was a heel and he's a chicken shit and he's running away from an ass kicking. And did you see when he, when old Take followed him out on the floor and posted MJF, the fans started chanting, You deserved it. You know, he keeps them engaged with they are interested in the match, not because of the moves that are being done, but because of the moves that are being done to him, MJF, or by him to the other guy. There's a difference in the way they follow the shit. And the one thing in it, I was conflicted on this because they fought on the top rope, jockeying for position, you know, the, the deal where they're, maybe MJF's going to back suplex him, but then Take turns around and clotheslines MJF, and he cut a complete backflip and landed on his feet in the middle of the ring and grabbed, like, sold his mouth, but, like, not tough enough, and fucking turns around and blisters take a shit. It was a long setup, but it was a wild-ass move. Does it really make sense? I'm not sure, but goddamn, it was impressive. It was one of those things, Brian. What'd you think? I don't have too big a problem with it. It was a great match. I'm not going to nitpick. Yeah, but, I mean, well, that specific thing, but it was, again... It was fabulously visual. And then they 
traded the forearms. People are chanting, this is awesome. And then again, telling the story. MJF has been going after the arm all that time. Well, then again, when, uh, oh, and I forgot, one more MJF hid behind the referee and then kicked the rope on his crotch, blah, blah, blah. But then he missed the knee drop. And MJF starts selling his knee. And again, that's the, the when MJF hit a powerbomb, then a couple minutes later on the powerbomb thing he does where he powerbombs the guy on his knee, he hurt the same knee and sold that. And they little things like getting a leg on the ropes for by MJF when Take almost had him. That got the people. And then finally... Take missed the senton off the top rope, and MJF got the arm bar. Take was trying to get the ropes, but MJF rolled through and cranked up on it and got the tap out. And it was a great match, and that was the right result. He's going into the main event of the pay-per-view. He needs the big win, but they, again, gave the people another... Imagine if... I don't know anybody that deserved it had actually got as much TV time... And I'm not saying he doesn't, but in the last three years, when a guy starts getting over and popular, usually that's when they disappear. At least now, Tony's giving them old take. So there was the match. And if it had ended right there, I'd say they hit pretty much of a home run. Right? Give me your thoughts to this point. I thought it was an excellent match. I loved it. I like Takeshita. I like him a lot. I think he's really good. I'm going to ignore everything he's done before he got to the States. Not that everything was him wrestling children or whatever, but at least he's not Kota Ibushi. That's what I always say. Oh, well, there you go. But I'm not, I, everything they've done with him so far has been good. And, you know, we could talk about it a little bit later because now something we've been talking about for a long time is all of a sudden being noticed by other people. The fact that AEW doesn't have any top stars or any top baby faces, really. They're building him up and the fans are into him. And I feel like they spent so much time over the last year with Yuta and Garcia, not that they're not talented, but pushing them way past yeah. where they should have been pushed. And if you think about all of that TV time, it wasn't used to either reinforce why fans should care about someone you already have there, whether it be a Wardlow who they completely bungled or various people, or find a way to make someone new. Because you've got a real problem at the top of the card. So, again, ignoring whatever it is that he's done that offended you and probably would offend a lot of us. <laughs> he's been good so far. They're not over-pushing him. The fans and, are and, taking and, to hey, him. Just, real quick, you mentioned Garcia and Yuta. There's a difference between deciding you're going to push somebody before the people ever see him, and then the people say, oh, okay, we're supposed to cheer him, and the people just deciding we want to cheer this guy, and then you start pushing him. Right. That's what the difference is. The acclaimed may not be as good in the ring as a Garcia or a Yuta technically, but the fans chose them, and that's why their matches started working, and everything started working. Maybe this is the wrong week to use that example. I was about to say, well, we'll get to them. But I thought it was a great match. One of the best matches in Dynamite history, dare I say. All right, here is the, the problem. is <sighs> twofold. None of it was MJF's fault because I mean, all of this stuff was right to do. The problem was, again, they've got a bunch of people that are inexperienced and green at or whatever they're trying to do and we can pretty much figure from this that take has never gotten color before and as i said earlier was probably concerned about uh, fucking it up not hurting himself but the, the other way losing the blade or not uh, something like that because he didn't carry it with him because after the match the referee, Paul Turner, gives MJF the diamond ring, dynamite diamond ring, and immediately he shoves the referee down, uses the ring, punches Take in the head, and boom. And Take is going to bleed, and MJF's going to get on him, beating him up, and then Danielson's going to come out and save him. Well, apparently, as MJF is glorifying, and you would think drawing all the attention, away, you know, he's turned to the hard camera, he's getting his hand up, blah, blah, blah. 
Paul Turner, they apparently decided he'd be the one to hand take his blade. But that again, they just happen to get a close up as Paul Turner reaches in his pocket and hands the blade to fucking take. And not only that, but uh, okay, and, and again, it's common if a guy has never done this before, or maybe only once in his life or whatever, he he doesn't want to carry it on his wrist because he's afraid he'll lose it. It'll come off. He doesn't want to carry it on his finger. You don't want a guy that's never done it before carrying it on his finger. He's going to have a 20 minute match. He could, could commit mayhem. So maybe it's decided the referee's going to hand it to him. Okay. That wouldn't have been a problem if the guy was any smarter about how to take it. And if they weren't shooting a close up of it at the time when the referee hands it to him, but then after he gets it handed to him, take rolls away and repositions the blade. He's rolling across the ring and he's repositioning the blade in his hand where now the hard cameras, because they've got off the close up, the hard camera is shoot. And you can still see the fucking tape around the blade in the guy's hand from the hard camera. And then Turner's handing the MJF the ring and MJF nails take and take goes down and get, he gets his, color and they didn't manage not to shoot that but then when they got on or when mjf got on take it starts punching him he still had the blade in his hand and it was you could tell because he's holding it in his thumb and his finger and not only could you see the tape but you could see the blood on his thumb and his finger he didn't put it away what he did when danielson comes runs in and saves and the doctors are checking on old take Paul Turner is there, but he's the referee. He's kneeling down, but he's just, you know, surveying the scene and the doctor's putting the compress on the guy's head. And you can see take look up and, and say something like, Hey, rep, rep. And the referee, what he reaches his hand out and hands the blade back to Paul Turner, which was a completely unnecessary handoff. And they're on a close up again. What the fuck? He could have, as soon as he got his shit, well, before MGF even got on him, he should have put it away. Because he didn't have to wrestle anymore. All he had to do was lay there and sell. It wasn't like he was going through a 20-minute match. He, he put it in his tights. Put it in his knee pad. He, he's been selling his arm through the entire match. He was wearing an elbow pad. Put it in your elbow pad. Hold it in your mouth. If it was done right, and I assume somebody made it for him, it's no thicker than a dime. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, if you don't put it in your trunks, you'll cut your dick off. Number one, it's no thicker than a dime. You're not going to give yourself an emergency appendectomy with this fucking thing if it was done right. And secondly, most people it, wear under trunks, and you try to slip it in between your outer trunks and your under trunks but there it keeps it in place there that's why they're called tights they're not baggy it's not going to be floating around your balls to lay there and sell or for god's sake uh, again once that he got nailed with the ring and went down and mjf got on top of him put him fucking mjf's tights that before anybody was looking for this shit or knew what to look for, the guys were magicians with the blade. That's why that it was so long before anybody ever really knew about it. Cause if a fucking guy nails you and then he, you're all the fans are looking at the guy with the brass knuckles on his hand and you've gone down by the time you've taken your bump and turned over, you've got your, color and you don't need it anymore as soon as he gets on top of you stick it in the front of his fucking tights nobody's looking for you to they, it looks like you're trying to pull the guy off of you but nobody <laughs> number one if they did go over it with this guy the fact that they didn't tell him to immediately put it away when he was that unconfident of his swordsmanship to begin with and secondly there ought to be a producer in the, if they're doing what they went over beforehand, there ought to be a producer in the truck that's saying, do is shoot anything, but little Johnny dipshit there as he's about to go drilling for oil. 
So I loved the match and the angle. I couldn't believe. And as another Stace was sitting there and go laughing, go look, I can see it from the hard camera. What's he doing? And again, not his fault. Not Takeshita's fault. Well, part of it is that he wasn't any smarter than that to, to not put it away and to... It, he was rolling around in the ring, repositioning it in his hand. I don't know what... Maybe he got it turned around and he didn't have his cutting edge marked. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Why hold it that long? I, I, so the the angle for me was kind of spoiled, even though it was the right thing to do. Get juice on the popular young baby face and have the challenger come down and save him. But I just, I couldn't look away. MJF, I don't know what you call it, shoving the referee? What was it? Pushing the referee? Whatever you want to say. He shoved him down. Last week, I think it was, we talked about a ref bump in a match and we realized it's the only ref bump we could ever remember in any AEW match. And here we they are broke the next... that string shortly. Yeah, here we are the next week and all of a sudden... Here we go again. I mean, there's the time and the place. I don't know if this is the right one for that, but it's noticeable at least. Well, hopefully Tony's running out of his own finishes and he's letting some of the guys do some of theirs because some of his finish, if these are indeed have been his finishes are crazy, but at the same point, then the wrestlers finishes are crazy too. But they went from, you can never say we're not going to do something because you're at one point or another, you're going to do it. And there's a reason, probably, why at some point or another, there's a reason to do most anything. So the people that are in the wrong are the people that say, we're either never going to do this or we're going to do this shit every week. And and so they've said, we're never going to have DQs. We're never going to have ref bumps. Now they've had two in two weeks of, of ref bumps. And... It's the same thing as they should have said, we're never going to have run-ins and we're never going to have backstage fights. And then we would have gone three years without run-ins and backstage fights. And now the first time they did one, holy shit, it'd it'd fucking get over. But since the ref bumps they've done have been just kind of pissy and not really remotely even executed well or in a feature match that really needed it or called for it, now they've just withheld a ref bump all this time and then done enough to make people sick of them in two weeks because it didn't work. Should Tony issue an edict all future blading should be done under the ring? No, I think Tony should issue an edict that all future blading should be done by competent professionals that know how to do it. Because, I, you know, a couple of times that I got color, I went under the ring because I was scared people were going to see me because I wasn't very good at it because I didn't have a lot of practice. But for if you're going to be a goddamn main event wrestler that should be getting color, then you ought to know how to fucking do it. And, uh, you know, the, remember we called on uh, the, the time that Punk showed him how to do it. Did it, but at the same time, you would have never known unless you knew what to look for. Maybe Chris Jericho's teaching the roster how to blade in front of the camera. It's sure not Harley Race, I'll tell you that. Anyway. Hey, after this match, though, I said, hey, great match. Great open to the show. Great open to the show. We'll see how long that fucking lasts. 